I've, I've reviewed everyone's uh, outline and set email to me by Google Docs, so we should receive an automated notification back on, on some comments. The major issues were people's scope was in, in a few cases a little bit ambitious. They were considering the notion that had two or three separators in there. So I've reduced that in, in those cases down to just one unit. The report is too short we have to be looking at sizing um, multiple separations. I know it's tough sometimes because the, the separation units are, are coupled in some ways. So for example, the Metazola often has a corresponding stripper with it, so it's tempting to want to look at both, and they naturally do go together. But uh, I am going to be very strict on my 10 page limits. The 10 page limit includes the couple page appendices, references. I will not be able to be uh, looking beyond 10 pages, so pretty much I'm going to be up to page 10, and that's it. Uh, the reason is because I'm receiving 40 reports times 10 pages um, for this course and for another course I'm receiving multiple reports that are 30 pages long, long so I just don't have the time to read that much material in the 3-4 days that I have to grade all of them. So 10 pages maximum, strictly enforced. So that means you must just focus on a single unit operation. Um, what will be helpful is if you describe the overall flow sheet that uh, the unit in context will be, and then focus on the design of that single separator. Uh, that's the key objective of this project, is to focus on the sizing of that unit. Um, and to do that, what you obviously need is some basis for it. So you need to, to establish what the inlet requirements are, so the inlet flows into that separator, the inlet composition, inlet pressure, inlet temperature, or you may have the outlet, the required spec from the separator. You may uh, know the outlet flow, composition, and temperature, and so forth. Either of those can be specified and you, you calculate the other. Uh, and that's that the principle of sizing the unit. So we want to see detailed calculations on how you size that unit, the dimensions of the unit, um, for treating a certain feed. Either you're given a certain feed or you're given a certain outlet requirement. Um, so that's the major part of the report. So about six or seven pages probably would be on sizing the unit. Then the rest of it would be some discussion on capital costs, operating costs, um, what are the ESA, MSA requirements, what are those costing you every year. Uh, we want to see some discussion on that. And if maintenance of the unit is important, then we can add those in. So anything related to the, the operating of that unit. So that goes a little bit beyond what the separations course is about, but it, it helps you to look at these units as part of an engineering system and what and, and then they cost us money to operate. Indeed, we've been evaluating these sorts of units based on their cost. So if there's an alternative unit, uh, there's, there's probably a reason why you've chosen your unit over an alternative unit that could do something similar. And it probably comes down to the ESA costs and the MSA costs. So that is an important part of separation in general, is understanding why we pick one alternative over the other. Okay. So any any questions, clarification on the project? Um, there are just some administrative issues regarding timing. Uh, there's been a number of requests to move things around based on other courses, I guess, are, are getting pretty busy with competing assignments and tests and so on. So what I've done is that assignment four was due today in class. So today it was due. Um, it's now being moved to next week, Tuesday. So we've got a few extra days there for assignment four. The project report, which was then due on Friday the 9th, then has been cascaded over uh, down to the following week, just to bump that along, to give you a bit of extra time in between there. So you've got a weekend as well and a few days extra. Um, the sign of five, which was then due on the 16th, has then been bumped over to a week. But you now need, unfortunately, this is what I wanted to avoid, but with cascading this down, we, we get up to a clash. Here we've got the project presentations. So your two, three minute presentation from your report that you have to make to the class is now going to be happening the same week as you're working on your assignment five. So just be careful of time management there. But there is a fixed constraint that I cannot move, and as the 30th of November take-home exam is due that day, I cannot move it 
uh, further because the university does not allow me to have any material due during that week prior to exams. So the 30th of November is not a date that I can fix, so we can't cascade the sign five further down and, and um, you just won't have time to work on that and take the exam. So, so just be aware of those uh, four key uh, deadlines regarding this course coming up this month. So let's just quick recap last class, um, let's go back to the slide with two year notes. We were looking at cascading mixer settlers. So the first mixer settler is, we, we, you should be very good at, at, at understanding this construction over here. We take our feed F and we combine it with the solvent S, usually it's a pure solvent coming in with no solute concentration. So solute concentration is zero with some solute concentration in the feed. Combine it in a mixer and allow it to settle. That N mixture N is then given by the river rule at that, where that location is. And that point is defined based on the relative amount of solvent in the feed being, uh, being combined here. Once that system is allowed to equilibrate in the, in the settler, we will settle along the tie line or parallel to or interpolated to tie lines here. So we get an extract concentration coming out in stream E1 and a raffinate concentration coming out in R1. So this is uh, something that, that we're now, you did this in the, in the class as an exercise, so we can come along there, we find our mixture points, and then here in green, I'll draw where we equilibrate along that tie line. So wherever the tie line is closest to it, we will then get an extract one and a raffinate R1. Now that raffinate has some solutes in it still, and it can actually be fairly substantial amount that's remaining in the raffinate stream. So we wish to then contact it again with another in another round. So let's draw that one in blue this time. We'll then send that on to the second mixer unit. R1 then becomes the feed into the next unit. And we contact it with fresh solvent. And we don't have to use the same amount of solvent as we used the previous time. We're free to use a different amount of solvent. And when we contact it over there, we're going to get a second extract stream, E2, and a second wrap in the stream, R2. So we'll do this in, in, uh, in the next assignment. Um, you'll have an exercise with this. So let's take R1 now is become our feed. So the construction is identical to before. We don't do anything different. We just simply follow the same principle we followed earlier on on the second unit. So if we come across here, we're contacting pure solvent with graphene R1. So this time my line goes along over there. I'm, I'm working my second unit. And then the point M2, so here originally was M1. The point M2 depends on the relative amount of R1 and S that are being contacted. So R1 is not equal to F. The amount coming out in R1 is not the same as coming in at the feed. It's a different amount. So we, and S here may be a different amount to the original S that we used in the first unit. So that location of this mixing point, M2, is going to be at a different position along the line. It's not going to be the same fraction as before. It's going to be a different fraction, depending on our choice of S over here. And that's our main degree of freedom we have to influence this, is that choice of S. So we could use more solvent or less solvent. We had a, had a bit of a discussion in the last class on what, the, what that choice's implications are. So if, we, uh, if I pick a point here, though, let's say I, I add a certain amount of solvent that that lands up being, based on my lever rule, M2, I can then equilibrate now along that line as before. So I'll do this one in blue for this, this system. So we're equilibrating along whatever the, the closest tie lines are. And we get the concentrations here, E2 and R2. And then I can go and repeat that construction.
instruction for a third time and a fourth time, as many times as I need, until I, res until I obtain an amount of solute remaining in this rapid stream that I'm comfortable with, or that I'm allowed. It might be that I'm sending that rapid stream to wastewater municipal treatments, and there may be a limit on what the solute concentration can do. Um, it may be that the amount of solute I wish to extract has tremendous value for me, so I really want to make sure I extract in these E streams, E1, E2, E3, and so on, I want to make sure that I extract and recover all that valuable solute. So either way, my choice of how many mixer settlers I use is dependent maybe on environmental constraints over here, or it might be on economic constraints that I wish to recover that solute in the, in the heat streams. So one way we can quantify that, uh, so this is the new, the new slides in today's class. Let's take, um, let's take a look at this example here. If we consider we had three units, so three mixer settlers in series sending the rapid on from, from the first stream to the second unit, to the rapid from the second unit is sent to the third unit. I can define what's called an overall recovery of solute. So the overall amount of solute that I've recovered is 1 minus the, the solute concentration, or solute amount, I should say, in the raffinate. So X Rn is the mass fraction of solute in the stream Rn, my final settler. So in this case, n is 3. So what is the mass fraction of solute leaving here multiplied by the flow rate of that stream? So that's going to be the kilograms of solute that I'm essentially throwing away in my rapid stream. Divided by the kilograms of solute that I started off with. So XF, N, capital F, that's going to give me the kilograms of solute coming in in my feed. The new rate is giving me the kilograms of solute leaving in my raffinate, essentially what I'm throwing away. That ratio should ideally be small. So this part over here, that ratio should be a small number, and then one minus that gives me my overall recovery. The other way you can, you can see this if you write it out a little bit more with the mathematics is if you write out xf times capital F minus x in your final stream, xrn, times the raffinate flow rate divided by x F. Simply expand that term for recovery. And so you can see that mass of solute in minus out divided by n is essentially what it comes down to. Solute mass in minus solute mass out, and then ratio that to get a percentage recovery. So ideally that number should be very very high. You want a very high recovery. Remember we said at the start of this section, liquid liquid extraction, our two objectives are to maximize recovery and to maximize the concentration. What's well, concentration then of the extract? Well, in this case we've got multiple extract streams leaving. We've got E1, E2, E3. So we simply combine our extract streams. By that I mean we take these, these streams E1, E2, and we're going to combine them and form a single extract stream. I'm asking then what is the concentration of the solute in that combined stream. And it's simply the summation of the mass flows multiplied by the mass fraction in each stream divided by the total mass flow. So that defines my concentration. My overall concentration. In the, of the extract. We want both of those to be high. Okay, so those are two definitions that we're going to use for not just co-current units, we're now going to look next at counter-current flows, and we want those to be high for counter-current as well. Let's take a look at what, I, what, I, what the, that means is if we contrast these two, two uh, setups here on the left side of the co-current, situation which we've just been looking at, where we combine those extract streams together. Um, there's only two extract streams in this particular example, E1 and E2, but in general you'll have multiple of them. And in general you'll have the concentration leaving 
in the extract from the first units will be greater than the concentration of the extract in the second unit. We can see that over here. This concentration of solutes in E1 is higher up on the diagram than E2, and then if we repeated this a third time in the third mix, etc., that E3 will be even further, further down still. So every time my solute concentration leaving in the extract stream is going to go further and further down along that equilibrium. Um, and the key drawback about the co-current setup is that we're using fresh solvent every time. So tremendous amount of solvent usage, of pure solvent usage coming in in every one of those mixes. In the countercurrent stage, we're going to use much, much less solvent. Essentially, we feed only a single solvent stream in up over there. So capital S coming in in the countercurrent flow sheet, coming in, and it's contacting the raffinate from my first mix of settler. Then that, that same amount of solvent stream, or well, approximately the same amount of solvent stream, is going to lead to E2 and then be contacted with the fresh feed coming in from the first stage. And then that's going to lead to my extract. So here I'm using only a single solvent stream. And we're going to show in the assignment that that amount of solvent that you use over there is much, much less than the solvent that you would have used in the cold current setup. So a tremendous reduction in the amount of solvent required. And the recovery here is defined in, in exactly the same way. The recovery for a countercurrent setup is exactly identical. The equation is no different to before. We're just concerned with the amount of solute leaving in my final raffinate. So whatever my final stage is, in this case I've got only two stages, so R2. What is the mass flow of solute in that rapid stream divided by the mass flow of, of the solute coming in, in my feed? That's going to then define my recovery. The concentration definition is much, much simpler for, co for counter current. It's simply, what is the concentration of E1? Because there's only a single stream carrying out the solute dependence. So in the assignment, we'll go through this in the class tomorrow, which I've said is canceled. Uh, so there will be no teaching in the class tomorrow. But I will, um, I will be here to go through assignment four with you. Any questions? I know a few people have, have been trying to get in during my office hours. Um, if you can't make it through office hours, I will be here in class tomorrow to go through any questions on assignment four. And I will also have up on the slides here one of the questions from assignment five which will be exactly this, where you're doing the construction for co-current and a counter-current uh, setup. And you're going to prove to yourself in the assignment how much more efficient the counter-current setup is. So that question will be up here on the board. I'll have the ternary diagrams printed out on large sheets of paper for you. And you can work on it here as a tutorial type session. So no official teaching, but I will be around to help you either with assignment four or um, making sure that you understand what's going on in these countercurrent and co-current uh, constructions. So let's just uh, look at that theory then for, for countercurrent units. We started this at, in the last in the last class on Tuesday, and we'll we'll look at this now again, and then extend it to multiple units by the end of the class today. So we'll start with slowly with only two units. As I've said there just before, we've got our solvent coming in, capital S, and it's being contacted with a rapid stream here, R1. Now, R2, let's just take a look at what's leaving here. R2 should have very low solute concentration. We should have very little solute remaining in our rapid stream here. So R1 has some intermediate amount of solute concentration, and then F is our highest, uh, or has a high solute concentration coming in. So this intermediate strength of solvent is then being contacted with fresh solvent. That solvent should pick up the solute and take it out in extract two. So just in terms of the numbering, the extract and the raffinate are numbered based on the stage that they're leaving. So in stage two, the extract is called E2 and the raffinate is called R2. 
In stage one, paraffin is R1 and the extract is E1. So, R, so just bear that terminology in mind. So here we've got, coming in now to our first stage, we've got intermediate amounts of solutes loaded up in that extract stream. It's being contacted with fresh feed. That extract stream will pick up even further still solvent and then leave them as capital E1. So that's, this is not something that's unfamiliar to you. You've seen this before in your absorption and distillation sections of, of the previous mass transfer course. So what we're going to see now, however, is how to use the ternary diagrams to find what those concentrations in the streams are. That's going to be new. So what we do is we, it seems a little bit unusual, but we're going to construct this capital P value, which is called a pinch point, or an operating point. This operating point is defined from a mathematical construction based on the mass balance. So if we look at a mass balance on the first stage, we've got two streams coming in, F and E2, and two streams coming in, E1 and R1. Now, you may be tempted to think that S coming in, that mass flow of S is going to be the same mass flow in E2, and that's going to be the same mass flow of E1. That is not true. Those mass flows are different. Okay. Based on the lever rule that we'll see on the diagram, in fact, you enter in with a small amount of solute, you get whatever kilograms per hour is flowing here, E2 will be greater than S and it will pick up some more mass still and take it out of E1. So these masses, E1, E2, and S, they're not equal, nor are F, R1, and R2. So they're different masses. So we have to do a mass balance on each stage with the flow coming in equal to the flows leaving in kilograms per hour. Same for the second stage. We've got two flows leaving. I've written this flipped around a little bit. So here's my two flows leaving, R2 and E2 and my two flows coming in, S and R1. So let's, uh, let's rearrange, and I'm rearranging them intentionally so that my right-hand side here for stage one is the same as my left-hand side for stage two. So simple rearrangement then, and I can now group them here shown in brackets. So F minus E1 for my first stage is equal to R1 minus E2, the intermediate, flows over there between stage one and two, and then the two flows coming in and out from stage two over there, R2 minus S. So each one of those deltas are equal to each other. So that says, in other words, if we look at the diagram, F, okay, so this flow here, F minus E2 is equal to R1 minus E2, lower stream minus the upper stream, R2 minus S, the lower stream minus the upper stream. Every one of those cases, that flow difference is equal to the same value. So while these values, S and E2 and E1, they're changing, they're getting bigger and bigger as I go across, and these are in fact getting smaller and smaller as I go from left to right. The difference, however, is always constant at steady state. That's the key. That difference P my, is called my operating point and my operating flow. That's constant in every one of those cascades. So if I rearrange each one of those deltas now, let's just take a look, for example, at the first one. I have F minus E1 is equal to P. Rearrange that equation and write as F plus P is equal to E1. So it's, you're, that's the first rearrangement. The second and the third one follow the same approach. Notice here that, and I've written it intentionally this way, that the P's are, are stacked above each other. Essentially, what we're seeing here is that that P flow, that it is a flow of sorts. It's actually defined as a difference between the flows, but it could be, con, uh, could be uh, con, considered as a flow itself. If we follow the principle of the mass balance in a ternary diagram and the lever rule, we can see then that if we apply the lever rule that we normally say if we mix one stream with another, so for example, if I mix S with F, I'm going to get a mixture M1. So if I would write then S plus F 
is equal to m1, I know that those three points are uh, lying on, this, on, the, on a straight line connected with each other. So one flow, one amount of mass plus another amount of mass gets me my, another, another point on that line. Same idea here. F plus P is going to equal E1. That indicates that this point P must lie on a line that connects F and E1. That same point P is on a line, a different line, that connects R1 and E2. And P is also a point on a line that connects R2 and S. So every time if I draw these three lines, they must pass through a common point P. So where is this point P? That's, that's going to be our, our, our goal here, is to locate where that P is. Because it's a common operating point for all my stages. You notice here how P comes up as the difference between F and E1, the difference between R1 and E2, the difference between R2 and S. And if we have multiple stages, P is going to be the same value across all those stages. So this point P is a critical uh, value that we need to find. So we, we, we go about it as follows. This is the approach to calculate P. So you've got several slides here in sequence that show how to construct it for two units, and then we'll look in general how to construct it for n units. So for two units, let's start with simply. We say we've got a solvent S, pure solvent S, that we're, we're hoping to use to recover solute from a stream capital F. We almost, or we always do, have another piece of information. And our other piece of information this time is that we would like the raffinate concentration leaving, so XR2 in the final stream, I'd like that raffinate to contain no more than 0.5, or in other words, 5% of solute. Maybe that's due to a municipal limit that says you may not put more than 5% concentration of this toxic solute into the waste system. Or it may be saying that I need to recover 95% of my solute to make my process economically profitable. Either way, you would have some additional information that allows you to determine what that final solute concentration is in the final raffinate leaving. So then the question is, if we know F, we know S, and we know the compositions of F and S, and we now also have specified this third piece of information, the composition of the solute in the final rapid stream, can we calculate what is the concentration of the solute in the extract? So E1, in other words. What is the concentration of solute there in E1? So we're, we know the flow coming in, we know the, the solvent coming in, we know the compositions of the solvent, we know the composition of the flow. We know, given by this constraint or this requirement, we know what the concentration of the solute is in the We don't know the flow of the raffinate stream then. We only know the composition. But given that, can we calculate then what is the flow, oh, sorry, I should say, what is the concentration of the solute in this extract stream. Okay, so then the answer is yes, we, we definitely can. We can calculate what that concentration is going to be. And we do that by following the same idea as we've done before. We mentally do, or you, not mentally, you, you do a mass balance over this entire boundary. That, my laser point is not working so well today. Um, Okay, so we're doing a mass balance over this boundary here. So consider everything inside all these stages, whether I have two stages or multiple stages, we, we mentally lump those up together and call that my mixture capital M. And I can find where that point M is, because from the Lieber rule, I know how much my solvent flow is per kilograms per hour. I know my inlet flow capital F in kilograms per hour. So I can find point M. Point M is easily found in the same way we've done uh, in the past two classes. R2 now is saying that is my point where I would like to be at. 
I know I'm going to leave an equilibrium for my final stage, so I must be somewhere along my equilibrium curve, and I know what that concentration is going to be in R2. So a point R2 can, can be located. The way then to find what the concentration in E1 is, is to draw a line from R2, which we know, through the point capital M, which we found from, from our, our mixing rule, and we expand, extend it out over to the other end of the equilibrium curve and we locate E1. So that simply comes from mass balance overall. And overall mass balance over all the, all the stages. Lumping that into one conceptual mixture M. So that, if I took those two stages here and I, and I took all the liquid in them, combined them and created one mixture, that mixture would have a concentration at lambda over there. That's a hypothetical point n. It doesn't exist. But R2 then has this known composition. M is that mixture. If I allow that mixture to equilibrate, I would get two, an R2 stream leaving in my raffinate, and I'd have an E1 stream leaving in my extract. So, this line then that connects E1 through N and R2 is not a tie line. It's a mass balance line. It's simply an application of the Lieber rule and we're, we're applying it onto the ternary, ternary diagram. So step one then, calculate M. Step two, specify what your final rapid stream is. The next step is to construct a straight line through that final raffinate concentration and M and project out all the way to the equilibrium line and locate E1. So in this case, without it doing any calculations, I would already know what my expected concentration of solids is in E1. In this diagram, it's roughly 38%. Okay. So with no, no real work, we don't really know what's going on in the system, we don't know what those intermediate concentrations are, but we know what the overall concentrations are, with, with very little work. Now we apply the Lieber rule. So the Lieber rule says that, let's just, I've written it up here on the right hand side for you so we don't have to flip backwards and forwards. We, we, we had said earlier that points F and E1 will lie on a straight line passing through P. We had that from that derivation earlier. So F and E1, my inlet flow and my final extract, they must lie on a line passing through P. My solvent, and R2, so these two streams over here, S and R2, must also lie on a straight line passing through P. So I'm, I'm only considering my extreme points in this diagram, R2 and S, and F and E1. So these two extremes, that delta lies on a straight line P, and those two points. Those are my points that I do know. I know where they are, I simply pass those lines and I connect them out into P. And P will always lie on the raffinate side of the, of the, of the miscibility diagram. So this, this right-hand side of the diagram is the raffinate side. P will always lie on, on the raffinate side. And that's my operating point. Is that how, how, how P is found? Is that clear? No? No doubt on that. So now let's do some mental, mental adjustment. If we take this point M, okay, so M is what determines where M's location is. Where along the line is M? The ratio of F to S. Of F to S. So M is defined by how much flow I, I send to the system and S, my solvent flow. So let's fix my, my flow F. Let's fix capital F. We, we, that's usually the case. We've got a fixed feed F that we need to treat. So a fixed amount of F. And our variable, our degree of freedom that we specify is S, the amount of solvent. If I use more solvent or less solvent, this point M is going to move along the line this red line from left to right. So I'm going to move along here depending on if I use more solvent or less solvent. Point R2 is fixed. 
That's given by my requirement that I need a certain concentration in my raffinate. Point F is fixed up here. Point S is fixed. So the only thing that changes, if I move point M left to right, what's going to change? Think of it like a pair of scissors. So if you're hinging on that point M, point P is going to change. Point P is definitely going to move. F is fixed, R2 is fixed. I'm simply going to move this point M left and right along that red line. And point E1 then is going to come and shift up and down like that. So this bottom green line is connecting S through R2, that's fixed. S and R2 are fixed. This top line, green, has come, come down like that. As I move that point M, it's going to open and close like that. And essentially, if I keep moving that top green line that's currently angled down like this, if I keep moving it down, make it, I get to a point where that top green line is parallel to the bottom green line. At the extreme, I can make those two green lines parallel to each other. And I have then no operating point. And then it's in, you essentially you cannot run that system. That system will not work because there's no operating point. So that E1 then defines for me what my minimal concentration is that I'll, I'll see out in, in the extract stream. Another way of saying that is I will always have a concentration in my extract stream that exceeds E1. And there may be a simple explanation for those of you that don't kind of see this geometrical juggling in your head so easily, is take this green line S that connects R2. So here start with S and connect it through to R2. Take that green line and simply move it up parallel until you pass through point F. So F is where my feed that's fixed. So move that in this green line up parallel until you reach F. And then where that point E1 lands, that is your minimal amount that you'll, you'll see in the extract. Okay, so you'll always have an, an outflow in your extract that exceeds that E1 for, for a system that works. Okay, so in this case, that, that, that happens because R2 is fixed. We specify R2. Okay, that flow in the raffin, the concentration in the raffin, I've specified at, at 5% in this case. Okay, so that's just something to bear in mind, and we'll, we'll uh, look at that actually in the assignment of it. So what I want to point out then is for that minimum E1, for that minimum concentration, I can then find that red open circle point. Okay. I can find that point because it's on the line, that's the original red line that connects S to F. As I move that point, this was my original point M over here, as I move it to the left, so that's where I started, and then I moved it to the left. As I move it to the left, that blue line comes down, the green line comes in parallel, and that point with the open circle, that, can, that will find for me my maximum solvent flow rate. This is very interesting. If I put a solvent flow rate into the system that is greater than this, I cannot operate that system. That's really interesting because it's normal that it's what we expect, a, a minimum solvent flow rate. But this is telling me that if I exceed the solvent flow rate, I'm not able to operate that system. And in fact, what it, the implication is that if you exceed that solvent flow rate, you're just simply flushing out the system. You're diluting it. You're diluting it. You can't find a system that will equilibrate in a mixer sector type manner if you have solvent flows greater than this. So this sets an upper bound. And you'll find for countercurrent units, you'll always have lower solvent flows than this. And you'll find, when you prove this to yourself in the assignment, that that solvent flow will be much, much lower than if you had used co-current setup. So the countercurrent setup is extremely efficient in terms of solvent usage. And that's great, because solvents are usually our, one of our greatest costs in operating systems. Yes, uh, can this system still exist, even though there's no point P? 
the parallel path intersection. Yeah, so if you operated just below that solvent flow, you would have essentially many, many stages to get to, to where you want to be. So is that concentration, is that E in concentration get actually realizable, or is it yes. basically? It's, 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 you're at the bounds of realizing. Okay, so if that discussion uh, didn't sit well with you, didn't quite get it the first time, don't don't worry. Come back to those slides later on. Let's uh, let's come continue on with where we were originally. Um, we were at this point where we had found the first green line connecting S through R2, which was specified out to P, and we had our second green line where we have our node F, we have our node E1. And we connected those, and we by the intersection of those two lines, we found. So that's where we were. Okay. Now we can start to cascade the system. So once you've got your two outer green lines, we're going to now pick up where all the other operating points are in between. So here's the key. The key thing is to recognize is we, we, we found where E1 is from this construction. Let's take a look. E1 is the extract leaving from the first stage. It's in equilibrium with the raffin leaving the first stage, R1. And so it is appropriate then to connect E1 with R1 along the tie line. So E1 and R1 are connected by a tie line. It's not a mass balance, it's a, it's a pure equilibrium because E1 and R1 are leaving from that first stage in equilibrium with each other. Now we can go look at the second, uh, second stage. We had that R1 and E2, that delta between R1 and E2 is equal to capital P. So R1 and E2 must lie on a straight line passing through point P. Now I don't know where E2 is, but I do know where R1 is. I've just found R1 from the equilibrium tie line. And I also know where P is. So if P and R1 and E2 must lie in a straight line, then it's simple to say, let's construct from P through R1 and keep going until we locate where E2 is. So that was that third equation that I had. R1 plus P is equal to E2. I used the other two equations to find this bottom green line and the top green line. This third equation then is the intermediate line that connects now R1 and E2 through point P. So we simply bring our operating point back from P through R1, which I've just calculated, to then find my, my final point, my final point, which is E2. Now we can also say, well, hang on. You, you, earlier you said E1 and R1 leave in equilibrium with each other. Well, what about E2 and R2? They should also be in equilibrium with each other, leaving from the second stage. Absolutely they are. So if I bring a tie line from E2 and I follow the closest tie line, I should land up somewhere over there. And I may overshoot or undershoot R2 slightly. In this case, because I've kind of cleverly constructed the diagram, I land up pretty much on, on the point. Uh, because I did that just to illustrate this setup for you. Um, E2 and R2 on a tie line will land up pretty close to where R2 originally was. In practice, we don't know where that final stage exactly is. So essentially, we keep zigzagging across until we just overshoot our specification. Remember, R2 was specified. We had to be at 5%. But if I zigzag across, and I did say 7%, well, that's not good enough. I need to do one more iteration and come back, and I may be now at 4% the next time around. But that's, that's OK. I'd, I'd rather overshoot R2 than undershoot. So the last, the last unit in a cascade is always a special case, because we've got, you've got the point that's known, but you also have to make sure that you add an additional stage just to be sure that you actually achieve it. So what we'll end off with then is just to show the general case. And then we'll have a chance to do this in class tomorrow with a question. So in the general case, I'm not going to go through this too much other than 
Um, we're simply doing exactly the same as we did before. I'll simply look at this, this third equation, at this third row. Um, it's simply saying the flow differences between every one of my stages is equal to the same value. So the flow difference between F and E1, the flow difference between R1 and E2, the flow difference between R2 and E3, or in the nth case, that flow difference leaving and coming into my nth stage is the same as the flow difference leaving and entering the nth stage. And all the way, I keep going up until Rn minus S. So every one of these deltas is the same value capital P. That's the first, the first thing to recognize, that the deltas are equal to capital P. The second thing to recognize is that every stage is extract and wrap in equilibrium. So E1 and R1 in equilibrium, E2 and R2, EN and RN, EN and capital RN. So every one of those are in equilibrium by the timelines. So here's the general approach to follow. So this is a, a generic uh, diagram. We start off, we know what F is and we know what S is. My feed is specified and I'm going to mix it with a certain solvent amount S. And what I'm going to do is join F and S with a straight line and I'm going to locate that point capital M using this, the mass balance and the legal rule. Then I'm going to usually specify Rn. Usually I will know what Rn is down here, what my final rational concentration is. But I could also do it the other way around. I could also say I want to see a final extract of E1. Okay, so you may, you may have the design requirement on E1 up here rather than the design requirements on the final wrapper. Either one of those situations could work. Either you know E1 or you know Rn. Doesn't matter, you still join in with a straight line that passes through that, that point N to find the other one. So if you give one, you can find the other one. Okay, so that's what these first four steps are. The next four steps is, well, let's construct our time line, uh, sorry, our operating line. The easiest one is to connect S through Rn and keep going. And you construct then your upper one, E1 through F, and you extrapolate both of those until you find point P. And once you have your operating point P, then you can zigzag across. Either you zigzag from the bottom up or from the top down. Um, it, you could go either way. But in this case, I, I'll start going E1 to R1. That goes along the tie line. Once I've got R1, I connect R1 through P and I bring it all the way back to calculate E2. Then E2 and R2 are in equilibrium, E3 and R3, and then E close. So we'll have an opportunity then in the class tomorrow for you to try this out on a code counter system.